Hello, I'm Fred Shaw, and I'm the international spokesperson for the Citizens Commission on Human Rights and the executive director for the Inglewood South Bay NAACP. And you're watching the Red Booth. Hi, welcome to the Red Booth Show. I'm your host, Kimberly Q. On tonight's episode, I have Fred Shaw. He is the international spokesperson for the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, as well as the executive director for Inglewood and South Bay NAACP. And he's here to talk to us about some very important issues, and I hope you enjoy it. So, hello, Mr. Fred Shaw. How are you today? I'm just fine. Uh, thank you for having me on your show. Definitely. It's an honor to have you here, and I honestly believe very much in the cause that you're working towards um, to help with so many things in, in regards to human rights and you work with the Citizens Commission on Human Rights and you also work with the NAACP so it's really amazing um, what you've been doing and I'd love for people to kind of hear more about it. Well first of all let me uh, tell people what the Citizens Commission on Human Rights is. It's a watchdog organization that exposes psychiatric abuses and when we say psychiatric abuse, we're talking about the mass drugging of children and the fact that they're doing electric shock on, in this country on children and pregnant women. Right. I think it's terrible, and I can't believe they're still doing it. And, um, I mean, even my grandmother had, had it happen to her, um, <clears throat> which I think it happened like in elderly, you know, type facilities where they're like caring for those kind of people. But it feels like to me it's kind of like a way just to get them to to be quiet or to something like that, you know. But with kids even, it's just so much worse now that it's become acceptable to do that to children. It's just horrible to me. Well, it is horrible. And uh, you, you mentioned that they do, do it to the elderly. And really, the first thing that we should know is that there's no scientific basis that electroshock or the psychiatric drugs have any benefit for the people. Uh, if you looked at commercials lately, uh, they're starting to say that two thirds of the people taking uh, these drugs um, may need another drug to help them. That means that the drugs aren't working and now they're even after admitting it. So now that they are coming to that conclusion, they're using electroshock as the next step in making sure that people become mental health patients for life. And that's what they're doing. So they, if you don't benefit from the psychiatric drugs, which most people don't, then you are a candidate for electric shock treatment. Right. And what are some of the situations that you deal with in regards to that? Well, I mean, one of the, now with me, I'm one of the individuals that are out there trying to get electric shock banned across the nation, period. Um, through the NAACP, I've done things like uh, got legislation or, or resolutions passed that uh, prohibited electric shock on children or young adults under 21. But when we look at the devastation that is occurring, we have decided that electric shock need to be banned, period. Especially when you look at the inability for them to be able to tell the devastation that electric shock is causing on people. When you give it to women who are pregnant and cause miscarriages and you don't seem to know that something's wrong with that, then you shouldn't even be trusted with it, even if it worked. But since we know it doesn't work, then there's no need or no benefit to do that. One of the things that people need to look at, and I hope your audience pay attention to this, we're not supposed to do it to prisoners of war and terrorists. So why are we doing it to children and pregnant women? And before the mental health or the psychiatrists out there say, oh, it's a brain stimulant. Well, if you stuck your finger in an electric socket, that's 110 volts. Electric shock goes up to 460, in some case, 480 volts. So that's four times the power. It is the amount of power that you would use to keep a bear inside of a, of a facility or it's industrial type power. So when they doing that, it's not a stimulation, it's frying of the brain and then it makes people mental health patients for life. How did you first get involved with dealing with this issue? My son, um, he's 40 now, so I'm dating myself, but when he was... What, how could you have a 40 year old son? Yeah, yeah, butter me up. 
<laughs> but when he was, I think, in the third grade, they said he had dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And they said it was incurable. Mm -hmm. Now, I grew up in the city of Compton and the streets, and then I was a law enforcement officer with the L.A. County Sheriff Department, so I'm used to asking questions. Yeah. So they said that he needed to see a psychiatrist, and I said, for what? They said, so that they could help him with his self-esteem. I said, I'm his father. It's my job. So a friend of mine told me about a place, and I took my son to that place, and they had him doing his letters and numbers and all that and clay over and over and over. And he came home one time, and he was almost crying. And I don't want to do this anymore. I said, hang in there. Just hang in there for me. And then he came home one day and said, Dad, I don't think I have it anymore. I said, why? He said, I know my numbers. I know my letters. So I called the school and told him, I had my son under the private therapy. I want you, he wants the kid retested for dyslexia. And then they couldn't tell that he'd had it. So what that made, the question it made me ask was, how many kids are being told, or parents are being told that their kids have something that's not curable? And it is curable, because this is my son. This isn't somebody I heard about. This is my son. And then the same guy told me about the Citizens Commission on Human Rights. And then as I started getting educated on the devastation that psychiatry was having on the, on the nation as a whole, then I just had that spark hit me that this is the thing that I'm supposed to do. This is why I'm here, to mm. fight against this type of abuse. Mm. And I've, I've been working with CCHR for about 30 years now. Wow. And over the last three years, I really decided to get into the trenches yeah. and, and take responsibility for what's happening to the communities. That's amazing. Okay, we have to take a break, mm -hmm. but we will be right back with Mr. Fred Shaw. And welcome back to The Red Booth Show. I'm here with Mr. Fred Shaw. So I know that we were just discussing your work with the Citizens Commission on Human Rights and as an NAACP member as well. I find it very interesting that you were a police officer as well, and, and that you've transitioned to doing this work. And I definitely get the idea that you have purpose to protect people and help people, and that's most likely what got you started as a police officer in the first place. Well, you know, one of the things that... Oh, also uh, and you're seven feet tall, so that oh probably... Boy. <laughs> six, six, not seven feet. No, um, I've lived an interesting life. I've done a lot of different things. I've traveled many different paths. Um, I've more so than being a law enforcement officer. I've been an ordained minister since I was nine, uh, 19 years old. I've, I've done a lot of things. And, but all of it has led toward where I am right now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how the laws are forced to enforce what psychiatry is putting down. And you have the things like 5150 where it says if a person can't take care of themselves or are they a threat to others that you can um, take them and put them in, incarcerate them against their will. Mm -hmm. And in some cases that is beneficial. In a lot of cases you could just turn them over to their family. And so as a society, we keep paying. Did you see that a lot this, when you were a cop? Yeah, oh yeah, you run, you run into it. But a lot of those people could have went home. And we're paying for this in society. We're paying for the, do you know in this country we spend $190 billion a year on mental health. You're talking about your insurance rates dropping. You're talking about your medical bills not being as high. There's a lot of benefits that would come if they were made to prove what they're doing is effective. But they haven't been able to, and they are actually the cause of some of these problems. Like what? Can you give some examples? Well, most people don't know that 90% of all school shooters and mass shooters are on these psychiatric drugs. Right. In Las Vegas, in Dallas, Texas, you know, all of these type of things, I think Colorado, these people were on these drugs. Well, I think the natural assumption is, well, that's because they were crazy, so they were, that's why they were on those drugs and that's just what crazy people do or something, right? Yeah, but then if you look at the drugs, and the advertisement on the commercials, they say can cause suicidal thoughts or actions. Now, 
Anyone who can commit suicide can commit homicide. A suicide is just a homicide done to yourself. So when we look at this and there's this on every drug, if you start getting suicidal thoughts, if you start doing that, well, you, that means you didn't have it at first. Some of them say homicidal too. Homicidal thoughts or ideations. I think I've even seen that. So before. why would we even give somebody a drug that could cause that? I mean, well, because it's considered to be such a small percentage. Yeah. Well, if you don't have any scientific basis behind what you're doing, then a small percentage is a bad percentage. True. I mean, I get the idea if you got a drug that could cure 10 million people and eight people die, well, it's a good drug. I get me, that. Let me just say, I don't trust big pharma statistics anyway, because I honestly believe a lot of the papers that they put out, you know, they're bought and paid for in a lot of ways. And you can even talk, I've seen stuff from guys in the FDA that talk about this. I mean, this is a really sort of like corrupt system where it's like they're working with the big pharma and then they're working with the FDA and then that sort of thing. So you can't really trust even those statistics, but. Um, and a lot of times when you are working with big pharma, you are working with the FDA. You know, there's been um, a lot of talk about how the majority of the people in the FDA work for the pharmaceutical companies. Right. So how can they... Or have stock in them. Or. Well, most of them work there. In fact, some of them make more money working for the pharmaceutical companies than they make on their regular jobs. Right. So how do you... Um, conflict of interest. There it is. Right. It, you know, it's a conflict of interest. And how come they're not faced with the same standard that the rest of us are when it comes to that? Right. So that's what we're looking at with them. And, and uh, you know, you should not be able to be on the FDA and then work for the pharmaceutical company when you have to pass judgment on their drug. That's why if you look up right now, almost every drug, especially the psychiatric drugs, has some type of side effect that could kill you. So why are we taking it? Take the drug Chantex. It's used to stop people from smoking. If you look at that commercial, at least twice, maybe three times, it talks about death. Now, I'm supposed to- I start laughing when I watch those commercials. Absolutely. I was like, what, are you kidding me? Like, it's always worse than the actual original problem that you're well, talking you, about. Well, you hit on the right thing. Yeah, I'm like, I would never- <laughs> So why would I take a drug that could cause me to blow my brains out today so I don't die of cancer 30 years from now? See, but that's what happens when you're there to make money for an industry and you lose your ability to be biased, right. I mean unbiased. And so that's, that's where we're looking at with that. I'm not trying to attack the FDA. They also approve good medications. I'm not even here to attack the pharmaceuticals because they create medicines that also keep the body moving. But I am here to bring responsibility to the field of psychiatry who is supposed to be there to help the people. And when you know that these drugs are causing these type of things, because if you and I know it, and we're not even in that field, then they know it. Right. So that's, that's where the whole thing is, is going wrong. And how many dead bodies, how many blown away children, how many drowned children, how many uh, suicidal mothers and, and fathers and veterans, and how many of these people have to die before the FDA or somebody say, hey, you know, let's straighten this out. Right. That's where the problem is. Well, it's definitely a problem. We have to take another break. Okay. We'll be right back with Mr. Fred Shaw. And welcome back to the Red Booth Show. I'm here with Mr. Fred Shaw, and we are talking about some very important topics. And I know that you work with human rights violations regarding the psychiatric industry. You're also a, a director for the NAACP. So you've seen a lot of things out there in LA, in the streets, and how people have been handled also by mental health uh, industry as well. Um, and I, one of the things you were just talking about was about the shootings. Now I know this is a very controversial topic. The main rally is to take away guns, which to me, honestly, um, I'm, I'm definitely somebody who's pro having the right to bear arms. I understand the, the issue with like having, uh, you know, automatic weapons and like you know they call them assault rifles or whatever like people are like well why do you have that it's supposed to be so that we can protect ourselves from even if there's the need for some sort of invasion or even from our own government if something really crazy were to happen that was what the founding fathers 
um, intended that to be for. It's not to go around obviously shooting up schools and what's happening now. And from my perspective, that wasn't something that was uh, happening in this country before. It's something that's new. It's a recent thing for these kind of mass murders or mass shootings where someone just goes into a school and shoots up all the kids or, or goes into a mall or goes into a movie theater. This is not something that we've had in this country. Um, you know, f even back in the Wild West, we all were able to have carry guns and people did definitely have, you know, shootouts and standoffs and they would, you know, there were people that were killed by guns, but they weren't going in and having these types of children going and shooting each other in mass like that. So to me, I think there's something very different. And to me, it makes sense that it has to do with something very different being added to our culture. And that is these drugs and things that are mind altering drugs. So we're thinking that we're helping everybody and we're thinking that it's changing and fixing them. Like sort of in my view, how a cocaine addict thinks the cocaine makes them do better. They're like, oh, I'm doing so much better because, you know, I feel so great and they're having so much fun. Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, somebody who takes uh, methamphetamines and says, I get so much work done. And they think that these drugs are a benefit to them. But now it's got the stamp of the billion dollar industry and you've got people with these side effects that are being overlooked. And the other part that to me is really an issue is that the mainstream news stations who would normally go and do investigative reportings on this, they are starting to actually talk about this, which is really cool. But for a long time, the main people who were their funding source, if you look, is the advertisers on these big networks is drug companies. Mm -hmm. If you go and watch those networks, how many drug company commercials are you going to see? Those are the people that are paying their bills. And um, I'm sorry I'm talking so much no, about this, no, but no. I feel obviously it's an important issue. There was um, the, who is it, Rand Paul, I think, mm -hmm. was, was one of the people that was discussing this and had been trying to bring it to a big network and that um, they were like, we can't do that, it's against our sponsor's best interest. So that's, that's a problem. And that is the biggest problem. It's the, against the sponsor's best interest and a lot of t cases it's against the politician's best interest because of the money attached to it is against the school's best interest, is against foster care and probation and all of these different, it's against everybody's best interest because everybody's getting paid to do it. I'd be uh, interested in finding out what would be the reaction of the public if they weren't getting paid money for this? Even welfare mothers get more money if she puts her kid on disability and on this medication than she would normally get um, on welfare. So, you know, once you put the financial incentive to do something and you start making it to where nonprofits have to have the mental health component and they have to do that and, and stuff, and we're not against mental health. Right. We're against psychiatric abuse. Right. They just happen to be running this mental health system. Right. So therefore, you know, mental health gets lumped with it. We're right. all on like, mental health, you know? I know, obviously mental health is actually a huge thing and we want, I want people to have help and be able to get help. If there's, there are people that are suicidal out there. There's lots of people who need somebody to talk to, who need someone to call, who need assistance, who need professional help. Um, I guess my solution, what I was thinking, is that it should be, there should be options. There should be different things that you can do. There should be alternative medicine. There should be th th those kinds of things that um, are supported by, if we're going to pay for you to go and see this, you know, this type of technology that they're saying works, they're saying this is like the gold standard of mental health is this system, well, it should have more evidence in my opinion, and if you have if you have other ways that you want to deal with it, then that should be another way that you can instead of drugs. And you shouldn't be able to have a monopoly on the mental health system when it's not uh, proven to be effective in the first place. We should be able to have competition in the field and let it be based on results. And as long as we have the director of research for the American Psychiatric Association saying, we don't know the cause of mental illness, then why are they having a monopoly on it? Right. Maybe someone else does. And, but we can't hear from those people because they're locked out of it because everything is wrapped around the current mental health system. Right. So, you know, and, and, and. Which is just really tied to the drug industry. I think that's the main issue, you know. It's like that marriage has to break up <laughs> a well, little bit. Well, you know, and, 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 and mental health comes 
with all of these different disorders, mathematical disorder, caffeine disorder, you know, it's, it's almost laughable if it wasn't so devastating on, on our society. You know, we have soldiers coming back labeled with PTSD and some of them haven't even fought in war. So why are they taking the drugs for PTSD? If me and you were married and we get into big arguments and, and it's a nasty relationship, why do we get PTSD for that? You know, or it's just a way of milking society of the money. And that's what psychiatry is doing. And um, but there's so many other alternatives to that. You know, why don't we make sure that before a person is even looked at for a psychiatric drug, that he, he gets a full physical examination. I mean, complete blood work. Let's, how do we know the difference between depression and anemia? How do we know the difference between somebody battling, baffling uh, incoherently and somebody with a brain tumor? The thyroid can cause a lot of things that mirror mental illness. How come we don't make sure that the person gets the right care before we ever get to that point? In fact, we're doing the person harm because if you give him a psychiatric drug because he seems to be hallucinating and he has a tumor, you have delayed his care. And, and, and his chances of rectifying it before it gets out of hand. Yeah. So those, that's the first thing we should do. Yeah, I know. Okay, we have to take another break. Mm -hmm. So sorry. But we will be right back with Mr. Fred Shaw. And welcome back to the Redby Show. I'm here with Mr. Fred Shaw. So um, this is a very important topic that we've been talking about. And in case you were not with us before, Fred works with the Citizens Commission on Human Rights. And he also is a member of the NAACP for Inglewood and South Bay. Mm -hmm. So there was a story that I wanted to mention to you because you were talking about fi first checking for medical issues with um, mental health um, problems. One of the things that I recently found out about is that there was a boy who was playing hockey and he fell and got a concussion and actually had a, you know, a sort of a blood abscess or something mm -hmm. inside of his brain from the from the concussion. And he was sent to a, um, a, a mental health hospital and put on psychiatric medication, including lithium. And he was then on lithium for the next 20 years of his life. And um, this was not a mental health issue. This was just an injury. This was an actual brain injury. And I think that um, there's been lots of points like that where people find someone has either vitamin deficiencies, which can cause all sorts of side effects, um, tumors, like you said. There's so many things that don't get checked first. It's just instantly, and, and I know it because I had my kids in public school too, where it was like, well, ADD, let's get them on something. And it's like, it's like a, you know, it's too much of a conveyor belt getting kids onto drugs. I'm not saying that the, there's not beneficial drugs in our in the you know field in big pharma. There are obviously things that are curing diseases and helping us, and that's very good. But we also have to police the, the the side effects and the things that are actually causing problems for us, which is what you are there doing right now. And, and we're taught to say side effects, but actually it's the effect of the drugs. You know, there's no side effects to a drug. There's unintended or unwanted effects, but they are just the effects of the drug. Um, you know, what you were talking about is happening across this country. Uh, people are being injured, people are going in uh, with headaches, they're going in with some kind of nervous thing, and then they're being put on psychiatric drugs, and the actual diagnosis of what is going on with them is not being done. I want to tell you a story of a two-year-old girl. I was given a speech at Compton College and I mentioned that you should get a complete medical examination uh, before you put anybody on drugs. So a lady comes up to me and she says, this is what we're dealing with. We have a two year old in our foster home that howls like an animal in the night. She scratches her face, she pulls her hair, she yanks at her ear. When you go to pick her up, she fights you. Uh, she moans all during the day and the psychiatrist has put this two-year-old on Prozac, okay? So I said, take the child and get a full medical examination. She took the child to a hospital and the kid had a severe ear infection and head lice. Now, 
They could have gave her Prozac for the next 200 years. It would not have helped this child. Look at the amount of suffering the kid went through because nobody took her to the doctor just to get her checked out to find out that she had an ear infection, that she had little critters running around in her hair that was causing her to scratch and itch. Those things could have been handled so fast, but if you don't demand that people get a full medical, you don't know what's going on. And so, and then other things that we have to look at with these drugs, they carry permanent side of, or effects. And now they're starting to advertise if you get one of these distorters that make your mouth talk and move unwantedly and stuff, that's normal yeah, when like, you're taking this drug. I mean, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's true. There's a, like delirium tremens, right? Is that part of it? That's, that's like one, one of them. One and, of, and, that's where you like shake uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. And that's a drug side effects, which is like almost irreversible. Absolutely. And one of the things that we have to do in the society, let's call it just like you and I have been doing here on the show. They are drugs. We might forget sometimes because we take medications and medication is the thing. But these are drugs. And I'm going to prove it to you right now. Anybody out there can research Ritalin and you will find that it is basically the same drug as cocaine. If you took Adderall, it is basically the same drug as meth. Research it for yourself. So we're giving these little children uh, forms of cocaine and meth. We're legalizing marijuana. We're supporting the poppy fields in Afghanistan. What happened to the war on drugs? The war has become on us. And so, you know, if we're giving the babies forms of cocaine and meth, I mean, if you and I know this, I, they know that. So then, you know, the question is, is well, you know, what are they to do? What are we going to do? What did we used to do? We used to take care of the kids. The parents was responsible for his upbringing and stuff. We, we took away, and I'm not an advocate for, advocate for spanking, but we took this away, but then mental health can drug and electroshock your child. A law enforcement officer can beat, tase, or shoot your child, but you can't spank them. You know? So when you start giving government... When you and put it that way, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's well, really crazy. And, and that's the only way to really put it, because the idea, they didn't end spanking to help the child. They ended spanking so in 1965 when they passed those laws that they could feed these kids these drugs. They ended spanking because they knew if kids grew up unchastised that at some point you would have to turn them over to mental health. That's why it was done. It wasn't done because of the abuse of parents, which still, on that same percentage, abuse people today. So nothing changed other than who makes the money on this. It's just like if you... Well, look, and the scary thing, too, is as a parent, just one of the things that I it really perked up my ears is, like, your kids can actually be taken away from you if you don't put your kids on these drugs. And I'm like, excuse me? That's my child. And if I don't agree with that doctor then they have the right to take my kid away and I can actually get put into legal trouble as a, as a responsible parent. I can be like put in prison. This has actually happened where people lose their kids. There was, um, there was that one mother. Marianne Gabaldo. Was, she's the one the SWAT team came to get her kids. Right. Because she wouldn't put them her on kids. drugs. Yeah. Can you but, believe that? That's crazy. But in 2003 is when I created the marriage with the Citizens Commission on Human Rights in the NAACP is because they were forcing parents to put their kids Especially on drugs in the inner as a cities, condition right? for being in school. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. I'm no, 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 no. Talk no. Over you. I, I, no, I love it when you do when you do that or any host do that because that means I've hit a chord and they're getting passionate. <laughs> so that's what we need is the passion because so many of us say, yeah, that's terrible. Well, and then we don't do anything. You know what I'm saying? So I, yeah. I love it when people get passionate, you know? Yeah. So, but but the thing is, is that they would take from the school and tell you that they think your child needs to be uh, put under a psychiatrist, has ADHD or whatever. And over time, they would send it to children and family services and stuff and found medical neglect and take your child from you. Right. And that mother, Marianne Gabolto, um, she was w well within her rights and the courts decided that. But even after the courts ruled in her favor, they kept coming after her. They kept coming after her. 
See, because they don't want us to have the idea that a parent is the final say so over their children. Right. You know, so they would rather take that responsibility away from the parent, take it in government, and we see how government, when it comes to social benefit, has done across the board. Things have just gotten worse. Because it's not their lane. It's our lane to take care of our children. It's our lane to make sure justice is given in our society. Government is just supposed to run on our behalf. That's They're true. They're not supposed to be working against us. Amen to that. Amen to that. You know, I could keep talking to you a lot, but we have run out of time, Mr. No. Shaw. But I really appreciate you being on the show. I know this is not my typical type of interview, but every now and then I take on a cause and have somebody on the show, and I'm really glad that you came to talk about this issue. And um, I definitely think that it's a big problem in our inner cities. It's a vulnerable people, single mothers, and foster kids, and just the children and stuff. So thank you for what you're doing, and thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it.